Thanks a lot. Good morning. I am honored again to have an opportunity to share with you. Uh, I'm going to go about it a little bit differently, and I'm going to speak a little bit faster because we're on a time constraint. I was going to take my watch off and just lay it right here, but usually uh, when a minister does that, look at the person say the person next to you and say, neighbor. That means absolutely nothing. So I'm not going to waste time doing that. Uh, if somebody said, hey, Bill, what do you do for a living? I, I keep it real with people, and I ask them to keep it real with me. Amen? Amen? How many of you want me to be real? Raise your hands. Okay, I'm going to see how real you're going to be first. Um, how many of you have found out life's a lot more difficult than you thought it would be? How many of you find out serving Jesus is a lot more difficult than you thought it would be? How many of you find yourself doing stupid stuff every once in a while? How many of us do stupid stuff we know it's stupid and we do it anyway? Look at your neighbor, say, neighbor. neighbor. What in the ham sandwich is the matter with you? <laughs> okay. And then how many of us have one of these in our lives? Something that we've done, our attitude about it is, oh my God, I hope no one ever finds out I did that. Anybody? Oh say neighbor. neighbor. And I won't be telling you about it either. <laughs> so we won't do it as much as we did in the first service, but Ephesians 4.25 says, cease them with lying. In one translation it says, it, cease them with lying and tell your neighbor the truth. Because we're not separate units, but intimately united in Christ. I think that's God's way of saying be real with each other. And I think the world is looking for something that's real. And we have him. And his name is Jesus. Okay, so the Bible says, know those that labor among you. I just share a little bit about my life, uh, but there's a portion of it. You know, we are all the products of people who have loved us and people who have not loved us. And some of us have had people who've loved us well, and then we've had some people who did not do a real good job of that. And, uh, you know, God is love. And so the Bible says, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And we know he manifested himself in the person of Jesus Christ. So love itself showed up on the earth one day and did all kinds of loving, wonderful things. And we're going to talk about that Jesus today. But born and raised in New York City, grew up in a very dysfunctional family. My mom was involved with organized crime. I don't realize that until many years later when I began to investigate organized crime. And I look back, I was like, dang, that's what mommy used to do. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was the victim of child abuse, some of it was severe, at her hands. I didn't realize it was child abuse. I just thought I was getting my beaten. Uh, then I realized it wasn't. I looked back, I was like, dang, that's what mommy used to do. And I worked for Young Life for 22 years, and uh, I saw a girl at one of our camps. She had a t-shirt on. It said, save your drama for your mama. Say, neighbor. neighbor. Bill's mama was his drama, okay? <laughs> And they had two other cousins that lived in the house, A.B. and Betty. A.B. was the brother I never had. He was five years older than me. Betty was 15 when I was born. Uh, she lived a very wild, promiscuous life. And um, I heard she had a kid, but I never saw that kid. Mom dies when I'm 13 years old. And uh, day I find that the day she dies, I find out she's not my mother. But the girl who I thought was my cousin, Betty, that was my real mother. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Dang. <laughs> You know, what do you do with that? What do you do with that when you don't know who Jesus is? And I heard she went to have me aborted, and the lady who did illegal abortions talked her out of doing that abortion. That woman made a living doing that, and that woman became my godmother and gave her life to Jesus. And in the year 2000, God gave me the honor of officiating her funeral. So she could have buried me in 1947, and God gave me the honor of burying her in the year 2000. Say, neighbor. neighbor. There's no way in the world he could be that old. Okay, so... <laughs> But my life just spiraled out of control, went to an all-boys high school, very violent when I was a kid, played football, real good athlete. Football season ends my senior year. I quit school, began running the streets of New York and hanging out with a crew that was doing bank robberies and murder. And so I joined the military to keep from going to jail. Uh, got married to my first wife and when I was in the military. Pam was here this morning. She's not here now. Uh, and we were married for 46 years before Jesus uh, brought her home to himself. And uh, brought a lot of stuff into my marriage, brought a lot of stuff into the police department, the badge that had no ability to change the character of the man. And as a result, I became a character. And then I began to uh, self medicate myself with drugs and alcohol, made detective very early on the SWAT team, but living a dual life. And one day I got real. December 26, 1980 at 245 in the afternoon, watching television, the man on TV asked two questions. He pointed at the screen. He said, hey, are you a sinner? I said, yep. You know Jesus? Nope. Called his telephone number. I called the telephone number. 
Pray with a man on the telephone. Total deliverance from drugs and alcohol. Received Christ in my life. Uh, God turned my life around. I became a different husband. I became a different police officer. I became a different father. My kids for a while was trying to figure out who's the new guy. But God had really done something because the Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they become a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Amen? Amen. Okay, but when we come, we bring baggage with us. How many of us have some baggage? Anybody in the house? Okay, everybody go like this right quick. These are your 3D spiritual glasses. They allow you to look into the spirit realm. Everybody put your 3D glasses on. Now look your neighbor up and down. Say neighbor. Oh, you got a lot more baggage than I thought you had. And, and what we become good at is hiding our baggage. How many of us kind of know how to act like we got it all together? How many of us know we don't have it all together? And that's why the Bible says in, in, in Ephesians, it says, he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God later on calls me to be a ministry. I become a minister, rather, I become a chaplain at a residential treatment center for emotionally disturbed boys. 300 boys out of New York City, out of homes of abuse and neglect, 300 boys out of a home just like mine. And I thought I was going there to be the healer, but God sent me there to be healed. And he gave me 300 little bills to work with. Amen. Yeah. And so God leaves no stones unturned. Uh, uh, Winston Churchill wrote a book called Amid These Storms. And the subtitle is Thoughts and Adventures. Uh, when God wants to teach us something, he'll take us on a journey. And I want us to think about that. The Lord wants to take you and I somewhere. Today, I want you to think about going home different than the way you came. Ezekiel 46, 9 says, when the people come into the Lord's house on the feast day to worship, let those who come through the north gate leave through the south gate, and let those who come through the south gate leave through the north gate. Let no one leave through the gate in which they came. I think that's God's way of saying to her, when you come into my presence, when you sing songs of praise and worship and adoration, when you hear the word of God, when you pray, even today, you take communion, you get an opportunity to go home a different way. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. Whatever, you do, whatever you do, don't go home the way you came. Way and I want us to think about that. That'd be my last question right now. How many of you have ever heard a message and you went something like this? Oh, so-and-so should have been here to hear that word. How many people have ever done that? Okay. But they weren't there. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I wonder who God was talking to. So this is for us. Don't be like projecting on anybody else. This is just for us today. Okay, so uh, Jesus shows up and, and he calls people to follow him. He chooses. He chose you. You didn't choose him. He chose you. He chose you and I in spite of you and I. And uh, what, one of the things he's quoted most is saying, follow me. Two words. He said it nine times. He's quoted 13 times throughout the Gospels. And, and so here he just says, come on, follow me. He wants to take us somewhere. And so in the book of Mark in the fourth chapter, the 35th verse, on the evening of that day, it says, this wasn't just any day. This was that day. And we all have some that days in our lives. On the evening of that day, he says to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. He has been teaching on the word of God. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please the Lord. Where does faith come from then? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Jesus says man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Amen. So the, he had been teaching now and he's finished. His disciples have been listening. Okay. And so now he says, let's go over to the other side. And then the Bible says, and they took him like he was. And you have to take Jesus as he is, just like Jesus takes you and I as we are. He takes us as we are, but he refuses to leave us that way. And he begins to mold us and conform us into his image. Amen. So the, the Bible says they go down, they get into some boats, and Jesus is tired, he's, 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 he's a little exhausted, and he goes to sleep on a mat. And, and I shared this morning that when I speak and when I read the Word of God, it, it turns into a movie for me, and I could just see it happening. So Jesus is asleep, maybe it's high 85, not a cloud in the sky. Uh, Pam and I were in Israel a couple of years ago, and the, the lake was like crystal, maybe it was that way that day. They get out and they start. The storm comes here. It's not taking you by surprise if you've been listening to the weather. They've been talking about it for two or three days. One church closed its doors because they felt there was going to be a pretty severe storm. Doppler radar warned you. Back in the day, they didn't have any of that. And the one who knew about all kinds of storms was sleep. So Jesus goes to sleep on this mat, and they start rowing out. Oh, okay, whatever. Okay, or whatever Jewish fishermen sang in those days. I know it had nothing to do with the Wizard of Oz. So in the meantime, say, neighbor, let's get this out right now. Say, neighbor. 
oh, he won't be speaking here next week. Okay, so, so, so the deal is they go out and then all of a sudden the winds begin to kick up and the waves begin to rage and the water begins to come into the boat. And now these guys begin to, to bail water. The, the, the word that's used for this storm is the word that we would use maybe for a hurricane or, or, or a cyclone. It's not your normal storm. They're bailing water and Peter looks over and he sees Jesus asleep. What I love about Peter, he's always real. Folks, if you don't hear me say anything, the more real you are with God, the more real you will see him get with you. Okay, so Peter's real, not always right though. He's bailing, bailing, and he looks like, you sleep. Hey, don't you care that we perish? It's amazing when things go wrong, we start accusing God. We think he doesn't care. Jesus wakes up. Peace, be still. Another translation says, and he rebuked the wind and he calmed the sea. If the Bible was written in the hood, Jesus just simply said, chill. <laughs> that storm backed up off Jesus. <laughs> and then it says, and there was a great calm. A great calm. Meteorologists say it takes hours, sometimes days, for a, a turbulent sea to calm itself. The same voice that spoke the universe into existence spoke to that storm, and it shut up. What do you do with your storms? How about when you say, peace, be still, and your storm says, shut up and go sit down somewhere. <laughs> Okay, okay, just, just a thought. Okay, so. And then he turned to them, and he turns to you and I. Let's be in the boat. And he says to us, where's your faith? Why did you doubt? He was expecting them to trust him and to know that he had them and that he did care. The only thing they could say, listen to what they said, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? And maybe you hear that, and you say, well, Jesus is good with weather, but what about the storms that rage in my life? How many of you have ever had words come out your mouth you wish you could get them and put them back in? How many of you ever did something in a moment of being upset that felt good when you did it, but later on you were sorry you went there? How many of you have ever got laid down to go to bed at night and had a tear roll out of one eye across the bridge of your nose down into the other eye? How many people have ever had that happen to them? How many of you have ever gone to bed angry and when you woke up, you were nowhere near as angry as you were when you went to sleep? Where did the anger go? It doesn't go out the window and it doesn't go up the chimney. It goes downstairs and somebody comes along and pushes the right button and we get a chance to see a different side of you. Amen? Okay. Well, we hear this. That's Mark 4. Now we go to Mark 5. Jesus is going to the other side of the lake. So the Bible says, and they arrived on the other side of the lake in the country of the Gerasenes. And as Jesus was getting out of the boat, a man in the grip of an evil spirit rushed out to meet him from among the tombs where he was living. It was no longer possible for any human being to restrain him, even with the chain. And indeed, he had been frequently secured with fetters and lengths of chain, but he simply snapped the chains and broke the fetters into pieces. No one could do anything with him. And all through the night, as well as in the daytime, he screamed amongst the tombs and on the hillside, and he began to cut himself with stones. And now as soon as he sees Jesus in the distance, he comes running, screaming at the top of his lungs. Wow. Okay, they come up on the shore. Their hearts are still beating. They're still trying to figure out who Jesus is. And here comes this guy out of the cemetery. Bible lets us know he's naked. Bible lets us know there's two of them, but we're only going to focus on this guy. Doesn't give him a name. I give him a name. Mad Mo. Everybody knows about Mad Mo. Amen? How many of you all know some angry people? Anybody here know some people that like every single time you see them, they're angry about something. Anybody know somebody like that? Okay, so Mad Mo, he comes running at these guys. And I, I feel maybe one disciple, the Bible doesn't say it, but one disciple. Jesus, why don't we just get back in the boat and go back over <laughs> to the other side of the lake? But Jesus doesn't do that. He steps right into the middle of this man's storm. And he's not afraid of him. And he's not repulsed by him. Wow. And we all know the story, how he, he cast this demon out, and the demon has a name, and the name is Legion, for we are many. And the demon says, we know. How about what the demon says? We know who you are, son of God. Don't destroy us. Don't send us out of the territory. Allow us to go into those pigs. And Jesus allows them to go into the pigs. It's amazing the demons knew who Jesus was, but his disciples didn't. You know what the problem was with the disciples? They didn't know who they got themselves hooked up to. And more importantly than that, they didn't know who hooked himself up to them. And that same Jesus has hooked himself up to you if he's your Lord and Savior. Amen? Okay, so they run into the pigs, and the pigs run down the hill, and they drown themselves. The guys in charge of the pigs run to town uh, and into the hillside. They bring all the people out to the cemetery. I love this. I love what the Bible says, and I love what the Bible doesn't say. I think there are things that God leaves to our holy imagination, and I've got one of those. Amen? 
They get out to the cemetery. What do they find? Mad Mo, but he's no longer mad. He has clothes on. He's seated at the feet of Jesus. And the Bible said that he's in his right mind. Wow. How did that happen? You know what I think? What did Jesus say to this brother? Just as importantly, how did Mad Mo get out in that cemetery? What happened to him? Who hurt him? Who abused him? Who violated him? Who abandoned him? Who rejected him? Who hurt him? Who lied on him? How many times did Mad Mo then go to bed angry and violate the principle about not going to bed angry, not allowing the sun to go down on your wrath, not giving the devil that kind of a stronghold in your life? Where the enemy took advantage of that. That same enemy who can get no foothold in Jesus because Jesus says, behold, the prince of this world comes. He finds nothing in me. You and I don't make that boast. And I think about that. You know what else it doesn't say? It doesn't say what Jesus said to this guy. Eye to eye contact of someone who wasn't afraid to someone that wasn't repulsed, looking down the end of his nose at him. Maybe arms that took him. You know, the last hands that touched this man, chained this man. But the Bible says, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Jesus doesn't come to bind us up. He comes to set us free. I, I just think about that. Maybe to hear these words, I understand why you're the way you are. It's not your fault. Yes, you're responsible for your behavior. But there's a reason. The Bible says, and the people became afraid, no longer afraid of Mad Mo but afraid of Jesus. And they tell Jesus to leave. And Jesus doesn't force himself on anyone. So Jesus and his boys go down to get in the boat. And Mo wants to go too. And Jesus says to him, no. Go home. To your own people. Tell them what the Lord has done for you. And in the Phillips translation, and how kind he has been to you. He lived in a city called Decapolis. He went home and he began to publish it. And the Bible says the people were utterly amazed. Incredible things happen at the feet of Jesus. Jesus and his boys get in the boat and they go back over to the other side. There's a large crowd waiting there. In that crowd is one of the religious leaders. His name is Jairus. And he comes busting out to Jesus. Lord, my daughter, she's dying. We find out she's 12 years old. Please come to my home and lay your hands on her so she can be healed. And Jesus takes off to Jairus' house, this large crowd. But in the crowd, there's a woman. There's a woman who has a hemorrhage and an issue of blood. When you had an issue of blood, you were classified unclean. And I wonder how many people feel unclean. You know, we had this game that we used to play in New York City. It was called the Cootie Game. Anybody ever played the Cootie Game when you were kids? Anybody? Just three of us? Praise the Lord. <laughs> Men go like, yo, man, I ain't playing no cootie game. <laughs> Shut up. Okay, so, so, but you know, you pick, you know, ooh, you got cooties. And if you touch somebody, they would get your cooties. Well, she was unclean. And if she touched someone or something, it became unclean. And the Bible says she had been this way for 12 years, and she had gone from doctor to doctor. And instead of getting better, she only got worse. And the only thing that doctors did for her was took her money. And God used his doctors in unbelievable ways. But the doctors that she went to were unable to help her. And things got worse. And now she makes up her mind. Maybe she's even gone to Jairus and he's prayed for her and seemingly nothing happened, even though God does use human office to do that. Now she sees Jairus over there. I'm going to him. And if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know I could be made whole. And so here, Jesus on his way to Jairus' house. This woman's in the crowd. She's tired. She's weak. She's anemic. And finally, she gets close enough to reach out and touch the hem of Jesus' garment. And immediately, she realizes she's healed. Jesus, he's walking. He feels the virtue go out. Oh, and he turns around and he looks around. Who touched me? Peter. Who touched you? Who didn't touch you? Everybody was touching you. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Everybody was touching him, but only one person got healed. Okay, so what was that like? What's your name? Ellie. Ellie? Okay, Ellie, can I make you put part of the story? You can stay right there. I'm going to just make you part of the story. Let's pretend it was Ellie. So Jesus looks around. 
and his eyes lock on Ellie. And Ellie's like, no. <laughs> the Bible says Ellie threw herself at the feet of Jesus and told him her whole story. Everybody's got a story. And Jesus knew Ellie's story before she ever got there. But he knew how important it was for her to tell it. And he took time to listen. And I always think about this. We're getting there. I, we, I always think about this. Jairus, well, you could talk to Ellie later. <laughs> I had you first. But tell me, Ellie tells him the whole story. And then Jesus says to Ellie, daughter calls her right into the family. Go your way in peace. Your faith has made you whole. Ezekiel 46.9, for a madman and a sad girl, all made glad by the power of Jesus. And then Jesus continues on to Jairus' house. Jairus' servants come. Don't bother the master any longer. Your daughter's dead. Jesus says something crazy right here, except for the fact it was Jesus saying it. Don't be afraid. Just believe. You know what Jairus could have said? Just believe. Just believe. What? I ask you to heal my daughter. You stop to heal Ellie. Now my daughter's dead. How many of you have ever been angry at God? How many of you were angry at God, but you didn't tell God you were angry? Say neighbor. neighbor. You might as well tell him, because <laughs> he already knows. But those words in the original language says to Jairus, the faith that you had when you came to me, don't change now. Folks, don't change. He's got you. They go to Jairus' house. They had the people there mourning. Jesus says, hey, she's not dead, she's just asleep. And uh, they laughed him to scorn. God said, the Bible says God is not mocked. He dismisses them. And he goes into the house with Jairus, his wife, James, John, and Peter, closes the door behind himself. The law says you're not to touch anything or anyone that's dead. Jesus walks over to that little girl, takes her by the hand. Little girl, I say to you, arise. I believe her face began to flush with color. I believe her heart begins to beat. One translation says that her spirit returned to her. One translation says this, and the joy of her parents knew no bounds. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. You're, never too dead for Jesus. you're never too dead for Jesus. But some of us have storms raging now. We've been hurt, we've been wounded. You know, that day, let me give you the greatest that day of my Christian walk other than the day that I gave my life to the Lord. I was working at Children's Village. My boss, sick and tired of me, woman boss, sick and tired of me, kicking against her authority because my attitude was no woman tells me to do as a result of what had happened in my childhood. Key fight words at Children's Village are these two words, your mama. Black kids, brown kids, we know how to go there. Your old mama's one. White people don't play the your mama game too tough. You guys be like, you're a mother. Well, that's not real painful. <laughs> Say neighbor. neighbor. Cultural, Cultural. Not, racial. not racial. Okay. She's a white woman. She put her fist here and she said these words. What kind of a mother did you come from? Her? <laughs> and I walked away from her and I took a ride and I thought about that. I came from two moms and they messed my life up and they're both dead and I'm still angry. And these words came out of my mouth. Mommy, wherever you are, I forgive you. Betty, my real mother, wherever you are, I forgive you. Father, forgive me for what I've allowed that to do to me. And literally a weight came off of me that I never knew I was carrying. Mommy and Betty did not deserve my forgiveness any more than I deserved the forgiveness of God. And so the Bible says in Ephesians 4.32, and be as ready to forgive others as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. How many of you have been angry at somebody and they didn't know? Say neighbor. neighbor. Who's living rent free in your head? <laughs> You're driving to church. They come walking through. <laughs> Choking the steering wheel, thinking all kinds of crazy evil thoughts. They need to be forgiven. And it's not optional. You can exercise an option, but the second option is not good. Forgive because you've been forgiven for everything. Things that we do, 
things we've made grievous mistakes, things we can't get over, even though we know we're forgiven by God. Some of us need to stand in front of a mirror and point at the person in the mirror in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I choose to forgive you. Because when you don't forgive yourself, you're judging yourself. And Romans says, who are you to judge another man's servant? In other words, you don't belong to you anymore. You've been purchased with a price. You can't, you don't, God doesn't give you permission to judge yourself. And God has chosen not to judge you. As we hear in John 3.16. For God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I talk to a lot of people, a lot of anger, a lot of hurt, a lot of resentment. The church is divided as a result of the things that have happened to us. We need to forgive. We need to forgive so the light of Christ can shine forth out of our lives. And we can receive the joy of the Lord, for the joy of the Lord is the strength of his people. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding is able to guard our hearts and our minds. Maybe today, these things, whether it be a self-inflicted thing or an other-inflicted thing, that cause storms in our lives. And maybe those storms aren't raging. Maybe they're just quiet. Maybe it's just like dew. But it's there. God is saying, forgive. Forgive. Let the same God that spoke to that storm speak to yours and mine. Give him permission through forgiveness that he might say to you and I, peace, be still. That's the God that loves us. That's the God that has called us. The Bible says, let Jesus Christ be your example as to what your attitude should be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thanks, Bill challenges right from the beginning that the way we come in should be different than the way we go out. And so we've come into the presence of Jesus through praise, through communion, and through the preaching of the word. And so there's an invitation extended to anyone today, not to the next step room, but to the front. So what we're inviting people to do is to make a decision to leave a different way than the way they came in. And so maybe you came in full of angst about something that's going to happen in the future and you don't know how it's going to work out. So why don't you come forward, bring that to the Lord in prayer and leave here knowing that He will give you peace and He will guide your steps and He's already there. Or maybe you came in this morning and you're still wrestling with an addiction or a bad habit or a bad attitude and you want to leave a different way, well, then bring it to the Lord and say, I want to leave a different way. Lord, take that from me. Maybe you've come in here today and you're, you're in a relationship issue that is just killing you and you need to forgive or you need forgiveness or you need empowerment to change. So, Ask God to empower you with His Spirit to change. There is nothing that God can't accomplish. And so, if we make a decision to leave differently, God will honor that decision. You've been obedient in coming here. Now be obedient in asking Him for help. And now's an opportunity for you just to come forward, find a place on one of these chairs or kneel right here at the stage and silently pray your prayer to God. Ask God for help. Ask God for deliverance. Ask God for And we'll be here to pray over you and with you as the service closes. But we cannot underestimate the step that we take by faith asking God to change us. You've come in one way. Go out a different way. I hope you respond to the gospel.